So our second speaker is Mr. Yorgos Bakrasis. He is a PhD candidate in computer engineering at the University of Virginia. He is broadly interested in modeling safety and security of cyber physical systems and particularly interested in compositional cyber physical systems theory. Mr. Bakrasis will be presenting his talk, Compositionality in Cyber Physical Systems Theory. Over to you. Yes, hello everybody, I'm Yoris Bajigdis. I would like to talk about composition in general, but particularly a formal notion of composition. So often as systems engineer, we talk about optimization or sort of predictive mathematics. I am more interested in structural mathematics, how things are related. And I came to this problem because obviously I started in the beginning of my PhD thinking about what is a cyber physical system and I started examining, you know, things like the smart grid or autonomous vehicles, or even these days, like things we put in our body that I felt were largely unsafe. Um, and unfortunately, that came to be true, particularly when we add autonomy into systems. Um, you can see here that the indecision of a vehicle, namely not to stop, actually led to loss of life. And as I was thinking about all these things, I was thinking about modeling and uh, why we want to model things and what models mean. And I came upon this graph where I realized that like we really do need models in order to, assume, to, to assure the safety and security of systems because most of our decisions are highest in effectiveness and lowest in cost before we even start drafting requirements. This is a cyber physical systems context map. Um, I'm a co-author, but it was created uh, in the beginning of cyber physical systems by NIST and Edward Lee and all these people. And you can see here that we have several different areas. We have several different applications. Um, what I was interested in was that a lot of people were spending years and PhDs on the leaf nodes and in position papers, control people uh, will talk about hybrid consimulation or they will talk about how the techniques can transition into the systems engineering process, but nobody had really formalized what it means to really relate those leaf nodes at the end. And that's what I really wanted to uh, study. And I came upon what is called category theory. And recently there's been a new branch called applied category theory, which is basically exactly that. It started by putting structure in how different mathematical sectors are related. So for example, how is topology related to logic and how is logic related to real analysis, but these days it's also being used for programming languages particularly, or even uh, um, the stuff I'm going to show today, like in engineering, people have done a lot of things in control with category theory. So what is sort of the dream? The dream is that you have these semantics in the middle uh, that unify and scale system models. And what I mean by that is that you can have your different uh, di models like MATLAB, Simulink, uh, SysML, and you can have your data and you can have your requirements from your stakeholders, but all of them are kind of connected formally in the middle with some categorical semantics. And particularly, I came to this because I was thinking a lot in the beginning of my PhD, what does it mean for things to have a mission, a behavior, and an architecture? Um, and I kind of understand, I think most of us kind of understand what these things mean, but I was really struggling to answer my advisor's question about what do the traces really mean? You know, I had put trace as a general thing and I, and I didn't really know how to formulate this informally. So I tried to do it formally. Um, I also realized that this kind of, you know, view is useful in some areas, but not so useful in others. Um, requirements here obviously apply to both function implementation, but I, I kind of want to talk about restrictions over function implementation. So, the function of the system actually does have a behavior and architecture, but the implementation has a behavior and architecture. And this is going to become clear later on about how I explain what these things mean. So there is a, a category called the wiring diagram category, which looks and feels very similar to SysML and all those tools, including Simulink, where systems are boxes and inhabitants. And what that means is that like a mathematical description of what the box does goes in. And the wires, the wiring defines how the total subsystem is composed. So this semantic gap was very obvious to me. I was doing things in SysML and I, I wanted to talk about the things that I was doing in SysML as a static model with the things I was doing in Simulink in a dynamic model. But I, 
I never really knew how the two related except in my mind, in my own mental model, or how I could clearly communicate that to someone else. Additionally, I was also working in these sort of uh, Levison style safety requirements where these also were talking about the other two models. And then I realized that a lot of faults in cyber physical systems have different layers of abstraction themselves. Like we have uh, computer states, physical states, and hazardous states, but they're kind of connected. If something happens wrong in your computer state, it can affect your physical state, and then you can bring the system to hazardous state that can cause an accident. Obviously, there is the, the other, that something can happen in the physical environment that kind of influences your controller that causes a hazardous state. And I'm claiming that if we have semantic convergence at the modeling stage, even when we implement and deploy the system, we're going to have better tests for making sure these things don't happen. So that's showing in SysML as well. This is sort of the structure of SysML diagrams. And we have behavior requirements um, and structure diagrams. And you can pick and choose which ones there are. But you really don't have a notion of simulation here. I mean, you can have activity diagrams, but you really can't simulate a controller in SysML. So what is category theory? Well, a category is just something that has objects, morphisms, and implements composition. It also has identities. What do all these things mean? Well, in the category of sets and functions, the objects are sets, and the morphisms are functions. And the identities are basically meaning that if I have an object x, I can always recover x to another function called id. Um, what, do, what does this mean in general? It means that we can also have a category of graphs or a category of petroness that you see here on the right, or even a category of discrete dynamical systems. Um, this is a very useful way to think. And I think CERC does, a, does some work in hypergraphs. And you can kind of think categories as sort of hypergraphs on steroids. They add a little bit more structure, but the structure is very useful about speaking about different domains. Now, the important thing is that you can see on the right visually that these three things kind of look the same because they're all graphs. So you actually do have a way of translating between your Petronet definition to a graph definition and between your graph definition, let's say, and your discrete dynamical system definition. And we do this with functors. So what are functors? Functors are merely structure preserving maps. What I mean by that is that it translates all the objects with a well-known operation, but it also translates all the morphisms. So when you have, let's say, a list um, with n elements and you want to like get the cardinality of that list, that's actually not a mathematical function. Uh, it's, it's more of a functor because you have a way of translating something as a list into an integer, saying like six elements in a list. And this is a very powerful idea in the sense of we have behavioral diagrams, we have requirements diagrams, and I want to talk about structural diagrams. Even within the behavioral diagrams, you can see how those functors are useful because you can kind of translate um, different behaviors within the diagram itself by knowing how those behaviors are translated from one to the other. So the wiring diagram category kind of formalizes pictures, and that's useful both for visualization, which we really like, but also for sort of constructing a new modeling language based on these notions. So in this category, we have objects as pairs of sets. So it's set labeled and you have morphisms as functions. So it's very, it's very obvious to us that this is um, familiar with everything else that we're doing because we're not working in a weird category. We're working in sets, but we have a way of doing more things with those sets. There's, it's, it, there's more structure to it. Well, then we also might want to do things in parallel. So we have a thing called a monoidal uh, category, which in set, it just means a Cartesian product. And this can be thought of as sort of a parallel execution of processes. If I want to do something at the same time, I also have the tensor product. So let's think about this. We have some boxes that are not really connected. Um, then we connect them. And we, we say, let's say, what the expected uh, here, phi in and phi out um, functions are, or, or how the composite system translates what happens in those boxes. But at this point, they're kind of vacant. There is no behavior in the boxes. You're just, they're completely black boxed. But we have a very clear way of assigning behavior to those boxes. And that is uh, the monoidal functor we talked about before, um, which, is, which also constructs an algebra for anybody that's familiar with that term. So you have a sort of the wiring diagram category W, and then cat is the category of categories, sort of. It's, it's sort of all your choices together, um, which sometimes is useful and sometimes it's not in the sense of that 
you're too vague if you're speaking about cat sometimes and you're not some other times. So you have a functor that assigns semantics to boxes. So before we didn't really have any semantics, we didn't say what X, Y, and Z were mathematically. You have a way of doing the composite operation, which is that functor of functors sort of F of phi. And then you have a parallelizing operation as we talked about before with the tensor product. So what does this mean? It means that we can sort of model cyber physical systems compositionally. And uh, this is a way of defining, let's say a UAV. Um, you can see it's wiring diagram depiction on the right and sort of what we expect on the left, but those two are kind of isomorphic with each other in the sense that they relate to each other very strongly. They're the same thing. Um, and then we have a way of talking about what the inputs we expect are and what the outputs are. But the important thing here is that you're constructing a horizontal decomposition that's fully formal uh, with the operations we talked about before. Um, this comes with some problems, namely that you have a lot of junk information when you do it this way. And it, and it showed me actually that when people talk about composition informally or with set theoretic ways, um, it's kind of it's kind of a lie because you do need a lot more structure and uh, I can send you the paper for the rest of this because obviously I don't have a lot of time. And then we have a notion of what a slice category is. And a slice category, basically you can think about it um, very loosely and informally and potentially wrong mathematically, but it's, it's sort of a subset of the category we defined before. And in this category, we sort of have all the options that a system engineer can make. And some of them are valid and some of them are not. Here, I decided one of them um, for, for operating a UAV, but obviously you can think five more. And that's sort of the vertical decomposition we do um, in system design. And there is a way of relating those two. And I'm gonna show this more clearly a little bit later on. Then we also would like to assign a subset of requirements. And uh, the best way I found of doing this mathematically, even though I don't really talk about the translation between sort of the paper requirements and this, and I think we're all aware of the problems with that process, but at least as a notion of what we're doing, we have sort of a restriction, which is a relation on the inputs and the outputs of the system. For anybody that's um, familiar with assumed guarantee contracts, for example, this is a generalization of that. So what happens here? I say to each box or wiring diagram, assign this formula. And this formula, the only thing it really says is that the dot at the top is the most general mathematical description of a requirement. It's sort of what is called a universal property. And then for your particular implementation, you choose uh, a restriction on your inputs, Rx, and you choose a restriction on your outputs. And you can actually, if you do this properly, which is very hard, um, you can get to the subsystem contracts to produce a composite contract that makes sense. And for anybody that has worked with assumed guarantee contracts, that's pretty exciting. Um, it would be more exciting if there was a programming implementation, which I'm gonna talk about later. So a simple example here uh, is totally defined here. The, the, the contract is totally defined by the subcontracts and the wiring in the sense of this is a very simplified example, but you can see here that I have set contracts for X, Y, and Z, and my total contract is something that kind of takes everything together. Um, it doesn't take seven, for example, because seven is never going to be an output from X and Y. So um, th that's the sort of like composite operation here. So between categories, functors, and finally, natural transformations, you kind of have the basics of what category theory is. So natural transformations are basically maps between functors, or if you want to think about it this way, in one plane, you have operations of functors, in another plane, you have something different you want to do, where that's where you use a natural transformation. And uh, I don't really have the time to go into the formalism of what this means, but hopefully this picture gives you an idea, because I want to talk about this unification concept. So you can consider here objects X and Y and the function F as an empty process. I have a way, or I, or I just showed a way, of assigning behavior to the process X, behavior to the process Y, and also some meaning to the function F. And then I also have a way of assigning contracts to that. Well, that's not really unified because they're still somewhat disjoint. And the way we do this is actually because B and C form an algebra, we can actually use a natural transformation between them. And you can think of A as saying, what is for each behavior its contract? And it does so formally. Another way of thinking about those sort of um, traces and model views is that if I have an empty process and I have an algebra from, let's say, W to the category of categories, 
that the functor and the natural transformations give me a behavior for each of the boxes. So it does give us meaning, and you can do the same thing for the contracts. Um, so it does give us some formal meaning into what those traces that I started with mean. So as you go into safety engineering, you realize that there is no safety without security while there's security without safety. And that has become uh, more shown in recent years, I would say. So we have tried on here, which was a direct attempt at uh, you know, attacking uh, a plant and attacking particularly the safety systems of the plant. But you also have sort of like emergent effects, like someone is not really trying to kill anybody, but by a ransomware attack, which basically locks the systems um, in, a, in a hospital, a patient didn't have time to, to go there in time. So for me, addressing safety and security as a co-engineering problem is important. And category theory provides another tool, probably the most important uh, result of category theory, which is the Yoneda lemma. And Nat here means natural transformation. Hom just means form uh, morphisms. But what, what that really means is that in our context, if two objects agree at any given test, then they kind of behave the same. And the way I mean that is that even if you kind of make a mistake, even if, let's say, an attacker is probing the system with a tool like Nmap or something like that, and they don't find that you have two IMUs, but you have like uh, one IMU and one GPS, I would consider these two um, equivalent behaviorally in the sense that if you attack something in the system that's already there, it's still gonna sort of misbehave in a particular way. And we that's sort of the formal way of capturing this, but it's also the formal way of capturing this fog of war that, uh, that uh, attackers deal with. So when, we're talking as defenders about attackers, we often assume that they have full observability into the system or we really capture what the threat model means for those systems. And I think that this is good, this is, it works and that's how we should think about it. But I also think that it's more important to think about how an attacker spends most of his time before they attack learning the system and what that means for our modeling frameworks. And this sort of captured here with, with a game but games are useful in order to understand our world. When you're going into a strategy game, you have this sort of fog and you got to walk there in order to see it. And that's, that's what attackers kind of do in order to understand the system, right? So that's what the Yoneda lemma gives us. Then we have another way of modeling two types of attacks. One is a rewriting attack. So you can think of a rewriting attack as either severing or changing the inputs to a system. And that's why if you see the GPS over there, um, there, there's nothing going to it. The system actually does have a wire, but uh, we have a way to formally say that, oh, this input has changed and the attacker, let's say, did GPS spoofing. So now that means something for the rest of my system. The second thing that uh, we can do is sort of talk about rewiring attacks. And you can think about this, uh, about the red GPS is about attacking or somehow changing the firmware or even like supply chain attacks, um, or even in some sense, uh, social engineering attacks, if I had added the ground control station. And uh, we have a categorical framework of doing these things in wiring diagrams, which is important because I would like to make a modeling language and I would like to um, have all these things in this modeling language. I call this Talon because Talon is an automaton from ancient Greek uh, history. Um, and the whole point is that everything I talked about was at pretty high level. I didn't really want to spend time on the math, but the point is that it is hard to come up with new things when it comes to category theory. So what can we do in order to abstract away all this math that's useful to us, that gives us those traces formally and give it uh, sort of to the users without them having to know category theory? Um, there, there is developments in this area. Uh, back in the day, they used to call them like abstract nonsense uh, about category theory, but now we actually have tools like catlab.jl, which is for Julia, or Idris CT, which uh, implements category theory with dependent types. And right now, we're actually working on a prototype uh, version of having that behavior in contracts, not necessarily with a graphical user interface, but in a categorical framework, but without necessarily showing the categorical framework. Thank you. And I'm going to open up for questions. I'm going to also open up my camera. 
Thank you so much, Yergos. And perfect timing. We have about six minutes left for questions. So our question is, could you walk us through on slide 26 what you meant by seven is not a valid output? Oh, yes. I don't mean seven is not a valid output from Z. What I mean is like here, when you're doing your Cartesian product, seven is never going to come out of, uh, of X or Y because the range of X and Y is never going to be in seven. Does that make sense? That does to me. Sarah, was there anything you wanted to respond to that over the chat? You obviously kind of have whole of, uh, a whole of R here um, crossed with everything else. So, but that's a single value. Absolutely. Any other questions? Uh, Kara, there was um, a comment that Sarah made in the chat earlier um, that I think was super relevant, saying that uh, bless you for putting normal English into the category theory. Uh, up until now, she found it unapproachable. I think one of the biggest problems is that people that do category theory like to complicate things. Any other Feel free to email me if some, some stuff doesn't make sense. Um, and I can send you also the preprint we have online that kind of goes pretty into it. And I just want to thank Yorgos for their presentations in this session. Thank you.